In 1981, Boeing launched the 767. 44 years later, they're still building it. While the 787 Dreamliner gets all the headlines, this aging workhorse quietly dominates an entire segment of aviation. Here's why airlines and cargo carriers refuse to let it die. If you love stories that peel back the layers of how aviation really works, from economics to engineering, hit the subscribe button. There's a lot more to uncover about why the skies look the way they do. Let's start with the cargo world, because that's really where the 767 has found its second life. When most people think of air cargo, they picture massive jumbos like the Boeing 747 or the newer 777 freighters. But the real star of the cargo scene isn't the biggest jet, it's the most flexible one. Take FedEx. They operate more than 120 Boeing 767 freighters, a mix of 767-200F and 767-300F models. Most of them rolled off the assembly line in the 1990s and early 2000s, meaning these planes have already logged two decades of steady flying. Yet FedEx hasn't set a firm retirement date. That's because the 767 fits the hub-to-hub -hub cargo model almost perfectly. It can carry around 52 to 58 tons of payload, depending on the variant, and cover 3,000 to 6,000 nautical miles, a sweet spot for regional and transcontinental routes. It's cheaper to operate than a 777F, easier to fill than a 747F and much more versatile for shorter haul markets. Then there's UPS. They have more than 100 of them in service, mostly 767-300Fs. UPS uses them as the backbone of their medium haul network, connecting major hubs and smaller regional airports. The beauty of the 767 is its balance. Large enough for heavy cargo, but small enough to land almost anywhere. The 767 also fits perfectly into UPS's mixed fleet strategy. The giant 747-8Fs and MD-11Fs handle massive intercontinental loads. The 767, on the other hand, runs those medium-range, high-frequency routes that keep packages moving overnight. There's another reason it's unbeatable. Crew commonality. The Boeing 757 and 767 share the same type rating, which means pilots can fly both with minimal extra training. That's huge for airlines trying to manage costs and schedules efficiently. Then comes the conversion boom. A major part of the 767's modern day success. Companies like Israel Aerospace Industries and PIMCO specialize in turning old passenger 767s into freighters. The process takes about four to six months and costs around 30 to 40 million per jet. Here's where the math gets interesting. A used passenger 767 can be bought for five to 15 million. Add the conversion cost and you're still only in for around 50 million total. Compare that to more than 200 million for a brand new freighter and the return on investment becomes obvious. Every time Delta retires a passenger 767, FedEx or UPS often swoops in. They buy the airframe for a few million, send it for a conversion, and get another 15 years of life out of it. That's the 767 secret. It doesn't just have one life, it has two. While cargo keeps the 767 alive, some passenger airlines just can't quit it either. The biggest loyalist? Delta Airlines. As of 2025, Delta operates 77 Boeing 767s, mostly the 767-300ER and the longer 767-400ER. You'll see them on transatlantic routes, long domestic runs, and premium leisure flights to Hawaii and Latin America. Their average age? Over 25 years and yet there's no official retirement date in sight. Why hold on so long? It's all about smart economics. First, these aircrafts are fully paid off. No loans, no leases, no financial strings attached. Second, reliability. The 767 boasts over 99% dispatch reliability, meaning it rarely cancels due to mechanical issues. Third, flexibility. Delta can reconfigure them with premium cabins, Delta One suites, or extra legroom seating whatever the route demands. And then there's the common type rating again. Delta's pilots can operate both 757s and 767s without needing a completely new certification, which saves millions in training costs every year. United Airlines, meanwhile, has been trying to move on. They've announced plans to replace their 767s with 7879 Dreamliners and Airbus A321 XLRs. But thanks to delays in aircraft production and certification, some of those 767s are still flying today. And with pilot shortages across the industry, 
The sheer training and reliability of the 757-767 combos still make it worth keeping a few around. So while new jets get all the attention, airlines like Delta and United quietly rely on the 767 to keep their international schedules consistent. It's old, yes, but still dependable, still profitable, and still doing exactly what airlines need. If you've ever flown on one of these aging 767s, maybe on a transatlantic flight or to Hawaii, let me know in the comments where you went and how the experience felt. Was it comfortable? Nostalgic? We'd love to hear it. How does a design from the early 1980s keep going strong in 2025? It starts with durability. The 767 was built tough, designed to handle more than 60,000 flight cycles. Its aluminum alloy fuselage resists corrosion, the wings are sturdy, simple, and easy to maintain, and its engines, the Pratt & Whitney PW4000s, the General Electric CF6s, are some of the most proven power plants ever made. Maintenance costs are another key factor. With more than 1,280 aircraft built, spare parts are everywhere. Mechanics know the 767 inside and out, and every major maintenance, repair, and overhaul facility, MRO, on the planet is equipped to service it. A full heavy maintenance check, the dreaded D check, costs around two to three million, compared to five to eight million for a newer 787. That's a huge difference for airlines trying to stretch their budgets. And then there's the right size advantage. The 767 carries 200 to 300 passengers, or 52 to 58 tons of cargo. It flies up to 6,000 nautical miles, long enough for transatlantic routes, but small enough to fit into most airport gates. It's the perfect middle child between the narrow-body 757 and the wide-body 777. No, it's not the most fuel-efficient. It's not the quietest. But when an airline has already paid it off and it costs half as much to maintain as a newer model, it's hard to argue against keeping it in the lineup. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Boeing is still building the 767. How? Because of the KC-46 Pegasus, a military tanker based on the 767 2C airframe. The U.S. Air Force has ordered 179 of them. Production continues at Boeing's Everett Washington plant. That means the 767's tooling, supply chain, and workforce are still active. A huge reason why airlines and cargo companies can keep their older fleets going without worrying about parts shortages. In fact, the 767 is now the only commercial aircraft still being produced 44 years after its first flight. The 737 has been heavily redesigned multiple times. The 747 line shut down, 757 has been gone for years. But the 767, it just refuses to go quietly. At the end of the day, this all comes down to economics. A U-767-300 ER might cost an airline around $10 million, operating cost about $9,000 an hour. A brand new 787-9 Dreamliner, around $180 million, with operating costs of $11,000 per hour. Yes, the 787 is 20% more fuel efficient. When you factor in financing, insurance, and depreciation, that advantage disappears fast. For cargo operators, the math is even simpler. FedEx's 767s earn about $50,000 to $100,000 per flight on domestic routes, with operating costs under $9,000 per hour. Because they own the planes outright, nearly every flight's pure profit. And here's the real secret. A 767 can be parked during slow demand without any major financial hit. There's no massive loan payment hanging over it. It's old, paid for, and flexible, something new jets can't claim. That's why FedEx doesn't mind that the 767 burns more fuel than a 777F. They care that it's already paid off and every flight earns them money. So, when will the 767 finally fade away? For passengers, we'll probably still see them into the early 2030s. Delta plans gradual retirement between 2030 and 2035. United to finish by 2027, though delays could push that later. For cargo, though, expect the 767 to fly well into the 2040s, maybe even longer. And the KC-46 tanker? It'll likely remain in the U.S. Air Force service until the 2070s. That means this airframe, born in the 1970s design era, could be flying for a full century. That's a legacy few aircraft can match.
When you look at the 767's entire story, one thing becomes clear. Longevity isn't luck. It's design meeting economics. The 767 isn't the most advanced plane. It isn't the most beautiful. But it's the one that made the most sense again and again for airlines, cargo operators, and the military. It's durable, affordable, and endlessly adaptable. And sometimes in aviation, good enough turns out to be unbeatable. If you enjoyed this deep dive into how old jets like the 767 continue to shape modern aviation, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell because more stories like this are on the way. Thanks for watching.